Hello everyone, my name is Irina Bazik uh, and I'm excited to share my research with you today. Um, I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, my research examines the 19th century solo piano nocturnes composed by female composer pianists who were renowned at the time but have sadly been uh, excluded from the standard pianistic repertoire. Some of these composers you may have heard of, such as uh, Clara Wieck and uh, Fanny Hansel, uh, but there are others that remain mostly in the shadow, both in performance uh, as well as in scholarship. Um, and these are uh, Polish uh, composer pianist Maria Szymanowska, French composer pianist uh, Louise Farenk, uh, and Austrian composer and pianist Leopoldine Wojetka. When I first came across the nocturnes composed by these women uh, and saw the unusual forms and textures of these works, one question immediately came to mind. How much do we really know about this form given the fact that throughout the 20th and into the 21st century, for the most part, uh, the only nocturnes you can read about in scholarship or hear in performance halls uh, are those composed by Frederick Chopin and occasionally by John Field. Uh, this is further interesting as Nocturne was considered to be a feminine piece more suited for women to perform in a salon setting. So how can we then fully understand it uh, if we are not including the female perspective? These women had their own ideas um, about this genre, ideas that were often shockingly different than what we are used to hearing. To give you an example, uh, here are two separate nocturnes, uh, one by Chopin and one by Leopoldine Vlahetka. Now, you don't have to be a pianist uh, to notice how different these textures are. Uh, frankly, I don't think you even need to be a musician to notice that Vlahetka's score is so much busier. This is just a little tease for what is to come, but before I dive into the pieces, I do want to say a few words about the history of this genre and how it became one of the most iconic forms in the 19th century solo piano repertoire. Uh, the name Nocturne, uh, as a title, was first applied to musical pieces in the 18th century, when it indicated an ensemble piece in several movements normally played for an evening party. Uh, sometimes it carried the it Italian equivalent, uh, Notturno, uh, such as Mozart's Notturno in D or, and his Serenata Notturna. At this time, the piece was intended for performance at night, much like a serenade. The main difference between the serenade and the notturno was the time of the evening at which they would typically be performed. Uh, the serenade usually around 9 p.m. and the notturno closer to 11 p.m. Now, nocturne as a solo piano form appeared in the early 19th century and its invention is often affiliated to the Irish composer John Field. Field left a legacy of 16 nocturnes published between 1812 and 1836 which established him as the inventor of this new solo piano form. The genre title Nocturne was already present at the time Field published his first three piano nocturnes, but it is Field who combined the nocturne style and genre in a significant and moderately consistent way. Now, the main features of this style are the singing melody in the right hand and the broken chord accompaniment in the left hand. And here are a few examples of early nocturnes by Field, Chopin, and Szymanowska. Um, as you can see, this broken chord accompaniment style is employed by all three composers. And I'll give you an example now uh, by playing so you can um, hear how the, the, a typical nocturne of, uh, would sound at, uh, at the time. Uh, so the first example uh, is uh, John Field's Nocturne Number no. 1. Um. Uh, and the second example that you can see uh, on the slide is uh, Chopin's Nocturne Opus 9, uh, Number no. 1. So as you can see, uh, they're very similar. Uh, we can hear this broken chord uh, accompaniment uh, in, in the bass and a singing melodic line um, uh, in the, played with, with the right hand. And they are all uh, similar in, uh, in their character, very uh, sort of peaceful uh, uh, pieces. Now, it has been assumed that Chopin simply inherited uh, this well-established formula uh, uh, 
from field, uh, which then influenced the majority of scholarship on solo piano nocturnes, particularly during the 20th century. Chopin composed 21 nocturnes, which by far surpasses the other composers of that era. Uh, he was the first one to introduce a contrasting middle section in his nocturnes. Um, however, not the only one. It's actually um, uh, Clara Wieck who also um, uh, experimented with this model right around the same time as, uh, as Chopin. So in her nocturne, uh, Opus 6, uh, you can hear a, a contrasting uh, middle section. Uh, Chopin's legacy in this genre is immense, which is one of the reasons why scholars and performers consider him the master of the genre, but this also leads to a very narrow pool in nocturne scholarship, as most scholars to this day focus solely on nocturnes composed by Chopin. Uh, very few scholars have examined nocturnes composed by female composers. Uh, and amongst these uh, uh, studies, uh, most of the times, I should say, these studies revolve around nocturnes composed by Clara Wieck and Fanny Hansel, who are the two um, most famous uh, uh, female composers, uh, not just of the 19th century, but uh, in history. Uh, now, Wieck and Hansel uh, composed uh, one nocturne each, while Wieck's nocturne was published as part of the set uh, Soare Musical Opus 6 in 1836. Uh, Hansel never uh, published her nocturne during her lifetime. It is actually uh, due to the efforts of her great-great-granddaughter that um, this nocturne was published, among some other works, in 1986, which is 139 years after Hansel's death. Now, this may sh seem shocking, uh, particularly after one hears this masterpiece, but Hansel's decision not to publish the Nocturne perfectly captures the general climate of the time um, uh, towards female composers. Uh, although these women were celebrated as performers, they were openly discouraged from pursuing a career in uh, composition. Um, and it is precisely this fact that makes their input in nocturnes even more interesting and important as some of the innovations that they introduced could perhaps be explained as their way in proving themselves as uh, quote-unquote serious composers. Many of these nocturnes are quite virtuosic, incorporating piano techniques often found in other genres such as ballads, um, polonaises, and sometimes even etudes. Um, perhaps the best examples of these types of techniques can be found in Blachetka's Two Nocturnes, Opus 46. Um, composed in 1846, these works greatly depart uh, from the traditional nocturne. Uh, Blachetka creates a hybrid form by combining a nocturne with a polonaise uh, in her nocturne number one and uh, writing almost like a sketch for a piano concerto with an orchestra uh, in her nocturne number two. Um, here uh, you can see the uh, opening of her Nocturne number no. 1 and um, if you compare it to the scores that we uh, saw earlier, you can notice that uh, uh, in the left hand we don't have the harp-like accompaniment anymore. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a typical uh, Polonaise rhythm. Now a Polonaise it is a traditional Polish dance and its main characteristic is this Yum, pa, pa, pam, 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 that type of rhythm. And Blachetka um, uh, utilizes it right uh, from the beginning of the piece. So quite unusual to find this uh, in a nocturne, and it's actually uh, a sole example uh, in, uh, in the genre of such hybrid form. Uh, now this is, uh, uh, she, she, she did this, uh, oh, on purpose, obviously, but she uh, uh, there are clear connections connections between this piece and Chopin's Polonaise, Opus Twenty Six, Number One. So uh, uh, the more uh, I uh, 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 worked on this piece and 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 and, and researched it, I, I found more and more similarities between the two works. Uh, so in many ways, this Nocturne is like an homage to Chopin. Um, and, you know, Blachetka and Chopin were friends. Uh, Chopin even dedicated uh, a, a work to her, his Allegretto in uh, F-sharp major. And uh, uh, he even referred to her as the first 
piano Vienna so he you know had a lot of respect for her as a pianist uh, so um, it is not a mistake uh, uh, it is not by chance I should say that she decided to employ the um, uh, features of a Polonaise in this piece another um, uh, the similarity uh, with the Chopin's Polonaise can be found in the uh, main melodic line uh, of this nocturne. I will play from um, the measure three where the melody starts. Uh, so um, uh, that, that, that uh, you can compare it later with the, the theme of Chopin. <laughs> Now this piece is in D flat major, but the, the, the melody starts on a dominant. Uh, and in measure five, when she f finally uh, reaches the tonic again, this moment, uh, Chopin uses almost exactly the same uh, melody in his Polonaise uh, uh, when uh, he writes a B section in the D flat major. This is his theme. So if you strip everything else and you just leave the, the, the top line, you can see that they're almost identical. This is Blahetka's, and this is Chopin's. Quite interesting that she would, uh, that she would uh, choose that, uh, uh, that motif. And uh, it's also another similarity is uh, uh, the, the choice of keys. Chopin writes his poems in C-sharp minor and, and it has an elaborate B section in the enharmonic major, the D-flat major. And Blachetka uses exactly the same keys in, just in a reversed order. So she starts in D-flat major and then goes into C-sharp minor. Now, these uh, uh, similarities with the Polonaise um, uh, are not the only thing that make this uh, nocturne unique. Um, Blachetka um, uh, frequently uh, writes these uh, elaborate virtuosic bursts that are so unusual for the genre, and I will show you a few examples of this. So this is the first culmination point in the piece, uh, out of many, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I always joke that this is the moment in this nocturne that a pianist realizes that this piece has to be actually practiced for real and you can't just sort of wing it. Um, so this particular section, you know, the tempo should stay the same um, as the beginning of the piece, which makes these 30 second notes um, extremely fast. Uh, the dynamic is fortissimo, it's really loud. Um, and you are seeing here only the first four measures, but this uh, actually goes on for uh, quite a while, uh, this section. Um, and another challenging part is are these jumps in the left hand. Uh, that You can see sometimes they uh, encompass two octaves on the piano. So uh, it's uh, something that you would uh, you can almost see in an etude rather uh, rather than a nocturne. I mean, uh, quite un uh, unusual. This is how it sounds. Quite virtuosic. Um, another example is uh, the final culmination point where Blahetka uses uh, octaves written again in a fast tempo and uh, that are supposed to be played uh, also in a fortissimo dynamic. Uh, again, something that you don't commonly see in nocturnes. Um, uh, Chopin sporadically uses octaves in his nocturnes, but never to such extent like Blahetka does. Uh, you are seeing here the first three measures, but this goes on uh, for quite some time. And she also employs this same uh, the technique uh, in her other uh, in her second nocturne. Now another interesting thing in this uh, in this particular section is the marking vibrato, uh, which is a rare example that you would see in piano literature because it's you know impossible to do vibrato on a piano. Um, but um, I think uh, that it's there sort of more as a metaphor to how much intensity she expects uh, from pianist uh, in producing this sound because she writes this in the accompaniment, you have these chords um, that are fast triplets uh, played in fortissimo dynamic. You know, so it's um, almost uh, 
uh, trying to produce the same kind of intensity as a string player would do in a passionate moment in the piece with the, played with a lot of uh, vibrato. Um, and then another uh, example of still, we are still in the same nocturne, but this is now a third type of virtuosic technique that she's using. Um, here, this is the coda of the piece, and we have um, these uh, elaborate arpeggios that are shared between the hands, uh, and uh, in the middle, the melody is hidden. It's also divided uh, between the two hands. Uh, this type of texture can be found in um, another 19th century genre uh, called Lieder ohne Worte, Songs Without Words. It's the genre that was made popular by Felix Mendelssohn. Um, and the main characteristic of this genre uh, is exactly that three-hand texture where one of the voices is shared between the hands. This is uh, how that notation looks like. It, as you can see, you have, uh, you know, if you look at measure three, you have the top line, you have the 16th notes that are divided between the two hands, and then the bass line. Um, and this is, uh, although it's a similar um, character as a nocturne, it's precisely this type of texture that differentiates it from a nocturne. Um, and uh, Blahetka was not the only one to employ this, uh, also Louise Farenk and Fanny Hansel um, uh, utilize the same uh, features in their nocturnes. Uh, it's more, if you look at the scores, it's more obvious in the uh, uh, Farenk's nocturne. Uh, uh, just by the way how she uh, notates it, but uh, when you hear Fanny, Hels Fanny Hansel's Nocturno, you will you can recognize the same the same features, which is not really surprising considering the fact that you know she was Mendelssohn's sister and she contributed greatly in developing this form. So, why are all these things important, and uh, what do they teach us? You know, uh, the in-depth analysis of these nocturnes uh, show us the unusual textures, the hybrid forms and the uh, virtuosic demands, uh, suggesting a much greater variety in nocturne compositional style during the 19th century. Um, the, they give us insight to the compositional styles and approaches of female composers and pianists in the face of gendered criticism and expectations. These nocturnes by female composers defy the ideal of the feminine uh, with which nocturnes are often associated. An ideal that purports that women's music is more intimate than public facing concerti and symphonies fit for private salon consumption. Um, while there are other male composers from the era whose nocturnes have been forgotten, uh, my research focuses solely on renowned women who compose nocturnes for multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, their response to this genre is uniquely positioned given the genre itself was considered feminine. Uh, then there is a lack of research on women composer pianists in general. Um, and lastly, the unique forms and techniques they introduced in their nocturnes greatly differ from those composed by their male contemporaries. And, uh, you know, while performers are often encouraged to promote music by contemporary composers, um, it is equally important um, to research and promote past music that has been forgotten today. Um, the rewards of such research are manifold, leading to deepened and new understandings of canonic composers and of established genres. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, my uh, research, and if you're interested in uh, hearing these works, uh, I can share a YouTube link with, with everyone. Uh, maybe I'll share it in the chat uh, of my performance of all of these nocturnes. Thank you for your time.